Welcome back to the Creating One podcast. And in today's podcast, we're going to be doing a little bit of of a review slash summary of the movie, The Bodyguard. The Bodyguard um, is 30 years old this November. It debuted back in 1992 before Thanksgiving and also um, its soundtrack released um, before Thanksgiving of 1992. The soundtrack was very successful. It was executively produced by Whitney Houston, who had five songs on the soundtrack, and her producer, um, Clive Davis, from Arista Records. The movie's um, uh, titular song, I Will Always Love You, was originally penned and recorded by Dolly Parton, and it was very successful in its own right with its original release. However, the cover as done by Whitney Houston made that song even more successful. And it became considered to be the most successful song by a female artist of all time, with sales of 20 million units worldwide. The movie script, um, as wrote by Lawrence Kasdan, had been around for nearly two decades. Originally, it was um, propositioned to Ryan O'Neill to play the lead male and Diana Ross to play the lead female, but Diana Ross declined the role and the project pretty much sat on the shelf until it was sold. Um, and then we're coming up on 1990s where Kevin Costner, who had been a fairly bankable actor, very successful in movies such as No Way Out, Revenge, and the Untouchables decided that if he took the role as Frank Farmer, the lead act, the lead cast, he needed to select his own co-star, and he wanted Whitney Houston for the role. Uh, he was warned not to cast her, A, because she was black, and B, because her music career was cooling down, so to speak. Um, she had previously very successful albums, but her sales were slowing. They just thought, assumed that it was going to be crushing for his career, that his career would be done no favors by casting her um, for those specific reasons. But he said, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it with Whitney. And he took Whitney under his wing and nurtured her character to life. Whitney Houston had only done a couple of roles on television, on a soap opera and on the show Give Me a Break. And she had very little experience as an actress other than doing um, her own um, music videos. But she came across very, very realistically because it's really not far from what she actually is in terms of as a performer. And performers, especially when they're successful, can sometimes be a bit of a diva. So I never knew Whitney Houston uh, personally, of course, so I can't say what her personality was. I was always a fan. So of course, when the movie was, um, it was being advertised to come to the screen, I couldn't wait. I mean, I was like, I don't know how many times I'm gonna see it, but I'm gonna be probably one of the first persons in the chair when it comes to the local theater. And as so I was, I believe I saw it twice that month. The movie grossed uh, $450 million on a $25 million budget. Um, it was very successful as I stated, but critics found the performances to be lackluster. Um, uh, the soundtrack was way more successful as far as critics were concerned as far as its record sales, but also its nominations for some more prestigious awards like the Grammy. I believe it won Album of the Year. Uh, Whitney had um, five songs on the album and it was uh, executively produced by herself and her uh, producer at Arista Records, Clive Davis. 
Okay, so let's talk briefly about the summary of the movie. Um, you have um, Frank Farmer, who is a former Secret Service agent. He's played by Kevin Costner. And he is approached by Devaney, a friend of his, who is the manager of a entertainer by the name of Rachel Marin. Um, Rachel is an Academy Award uh, nominated um, performer at the time. And she's having some struggles um, with um, having um, stalkers and people who are threatening her life. And Devaney is taking this seriously, even though um, a lot of the information about what's going on in her life is being shielded from her. Um, he still finds it necessary to acquiesce uh, someone who knows the job, knows the ins and outs of security and how to protect her and do it um, in a way that doesn't impair her life. Um, Frank um, reluctantly um, accepts to just inspect, just to see. He doesn't, he's not going to take the job um, right out. He just wants to kind of see, get a survey. And when he arrives on um, her compound, he finds that it's way too easy to access. The, the security systems are either broken or not in place at all. He's able to get into the house without anybody asking him for security or any identification to prove who he is. When he arrives there, um, Rachel is shooting a music video. She's quite dismissive, flirty, and then kind of dismissive. But because again, she doesn't. She's not aware of all of the things that are going on because her team, and her team is her manager. Her team is also her sister, um, and her team is also her driver and her security guard. Uh, Frank is immediately. Um, he's he's not. He's not, he's not feeling the environment at all. He doesn't like the attitude of the people. They remind him exactly the reason why he doesn't like to guard celebrities. They're just way too um, obtuse, aloof, and you know, they, they breathe attention. And in his line of work, his job is to minimize the attention that people get. Um, being famous and familiar is a part of their job but it's not something that they always want to be known for. Unlike entertainers um, uh, who want the attention because the attention gets them more um, record sales, gets them more uh, being talked about more in the press, et cetera, et cetera. So Frank decides to leave, but he's stopped by Devaney who takes him to a bedroom and shows him some of evidence that Rachel definitely indeed needs security, but he, um, Frank decides, um, if I'm going to take this job, she needs to understand how serious this is. And of course, they promise that they're going to tell her, which they don't. <laughs> so Frank immediately um, jumps into action. He updates the security, changes the whole system, um, even gives um, uh, her driver and her then bodyguard um, a little bit of an upgrade on their assignment, which for the most part, most of them are not okay with because they got very comfortable and relaxed in an atmosphere where they obviously don't work a lot for the money in which they are being paid. I mean, Frank goes in and has the, the whole area, the, the bush is trimmed. Um, he's just done a lot of work to make it a much more secure environment for her, but she's struggling with this all the way. She feels like her privacy is being invaded, which is interesting considering the fact that she lives so openly. But anyway, um, Rachel has a, some deranged fans and it's not sure yet how many people um, in the beginning who are after her or trying to bring harm to her, but Frank is on top of the job. Uh, Rachel notices that there is an extreme camaraderie between her son, Fletcher, and Frank, and so she kind of softens up to the idea of maybe asking him out on a date. Frank decides to take her on a date. They go to this little dive, have some greasy food, they dance, and then they end up in a little sword play. They wake up, 
the next day after making love and Frank is very, very regretful because he believes he has crossed the line with his job. He doesn't feel he can protect her now because he's too emotionally involved. And this um, cold shoulder that he's delivering to her is not received well. Rachel goes back into defense mode and she is committed to making his job misery for him. Uh, Rachel even makes an attempt to make him jealous, which doesn't work because the guy Portman, who is a former colleague of Frank, um, who she uses to try to make Frank jealous, is um, a little bit too rough and aggressive with her. And of course, she drinks her sorrows away after having to be able to, after having to dismiss him. Wakes up the next day. She's hungover, but she is still um, angry and aggravated that her attempt to make Frank jealous is gone unnoticed. She decides to go out shopping without informing him, and this is where he draws the line. He's frantic, he's emotionally invested in this woman, and he can't even do his job. She's no longer taking, she is just making it unbearable for him to be able to do his job. He cites he's gonna quit. He's gonna get her back to home and then he's done. She gets a phone call, a prank phone call that scares her into a new reality. But of course, as previous times, you know, she resets very quickly. But at any rate, at this point, she promises that she's going to do better and he decides, okay, let's just take a break from all of this environment and let's go away. So they decide she and Frank go to a cabin where his father resides. She brings along her son Fletcher, her sister Nikki, her driver, and her security guard. And uh, when they arrive there, they're having a good time. They're eating, they're playing um, uh, chess and having a good old time. Uh, her son Fletcher decides to take the boat out and Frank immediately jumps into action, fearing that, you know, this is an opportunity for the um, person who is trying to make an attempt on her life to rig a boat. He jumps in, pulls Fletcher from the boat. Um, Rachel feels that he's overreacted. Uh, nearly, she considers him nearly drowning Fletcher, but the boat explodes and they are in panic mode now. They pack up and decide they're leaving out first thing in the morning and they're gonna guard the house. Frank is not gonna go to sleep and neither is his father. In that rate, we are now um, seeing her sister Nikki who is drinking heavily and sorrowful. Um, Frank realizes that something is up with her. His instincts kick into high gear. She admits that she hired the hitman and he is not gonna stop until the job is done. She, he is paid in full. She doesn't know who the person is, so unfortunately she can't call it off. The person makes another attempt on Rachel's life, believing Rachel is Nikki and fatally wounds her. They all return back home to memorialize um, her sister Nikki. It doesn't appear, never was apparent in the movie that Rachel knew her sister was behind it. And it is my belief that Frank decided not to tell her um, because if he had told her, I'm pretty sure she would not have gone to the Oscar awards, which is where she was nominated and won uh, the um, Oscar for lead actress in a movie title, I Have Nothing. As she goes up to receive the award, Frank notices that the cameraman is Portman, his former colleague, who she had an interlude with earlier. And he's not happy with seeing him as a cameraman because he knows he shouldn't be there. Not only should he not be there, but why is Portman holding a camera? 
So as she takes to the stage again as to receive her award, Frank um, jumps up, tries to block and shield her. A bullet releases, hits him. He's struck, but before he goes unconscious, he um, shoots Portman and then we move to the end. At the end of the movie, Rachel and Frank are basically going their separate ways. Um, he's done, as he has stated. He is going back to guarding less stressful environments with people who actually want and respect uh, having a security um, and bodyguard of his caliber. And of course, she's going on to perform as she always has. They embrace in a final goodbye, a very passionate kiss, one of the main highlights and hallmarks of the movie. And then the song plays, I Will Always Love You. And um, Whitney Houston is singing the song in Rachel Marin character, beautiful song. Um, and that is the end. The wonderful thing though about the movie that I can recall is how much I saw it literally change Whitney Houston's career. And she starred in more movies to come after that. Um, the Preacher's Wife, Waiting to Excel. I mean, to me, she's always been a phenomenal natural actress, way more talented than people would give her credit for. Um, I was always a fan. Probably some of my most favorite moments of the movie was when um, when Frank, um, he first really took an emotional interest in her. He was watching a music video. She was getting herself all dialed up to go to a venue where she was gonna be playing. And, you know, he really leans in, you know, he sits up in this posture and everything. You can see, uh, you know, Kevin Costner is an amazing actor, so, you know, he doesn't move on screen without you actually feeling his emotion shift and change. Um, so that was one of my favorite parts of the movie. One, another one of my favorite parts of the movie was when um, they go on their date and she's very relaxed. Well, she's always a pretty relaxed person, even though she's quite a diva. She's in the environment of the little dive. She's very relaxed um, and, you know, she, they dance or whatever. That was one of my favorite parts. Another one of my favorite parts, of course, was when um, she's singing with her sister at the cabin, Jesus Loves Me, which is um, also on the soundtrack. And we kind of know, which is typical sometimes, you have, a star, a real star in the family, which is what her sister Nikki mentions. They had formed a little band as kids and they put uh, baby sister um, Rachel in the act. And of course, Rachel was the one who was shining, got the most attention. And that was the thing that was pretty much fueling um, Nikki's resentment of her. She was a star. She has everything. And of course, Nikki felt like she has nothing. And of course, my most favorite part was the end. And it was so much, not so much the kiss. The kiss was amazing, but it was also the panning of the camera as it was spinning around, um, rotating around them. And you could see this 360 um, evolution of the camera panning around them as they kissed. They shared some really cute barbs with each other. Rachel was annoying. For all intents and purposes, she annoyed me. I mean, one minute she was listening to Frank, the next minute she was right back to being uptight and just unbearable to deal with. But Frank held in there as long as he could. And I, I often wondered, you know, what was he thinking? I mean, I know he was being paid a considerable amount of money to do the job, but I know she would have annoyed me and I would have quit probably on day one and never did the job. But at any rate, 
The movie is available on Netflix until the 30th of the month. I hope you guys get a chance to see it. Um, and if uh, you own the movie, uh, what were some of the things that you liked about it? Did you think it was as bad as the critics said it was? Um, I barely even noticed the movie's um, hiccups and weak points because I was just so enamored with the beauty on the screen, you know. As I said, I was a huge fan, still am a huge fan posthumously of Whitney Houston. And I was t taken by uh, Kevin Costner from his previous work. I thought he was an amazing actress, a handsome man, very dashing on screen, always, um, you know, just, you know, how do you, how do you explain an actor who has made all of the different films that he makes? throughout the years and he still credits um, this he, he never misses a chance or an opportunity to give Whitney Houston her flowers um, regard this movie you know and this year by it being its 30th um, anniversary of its debut in theaters he has yet another opportunity to speak his kindness over having knowing her and for that I appreciate him if you guys have any comments or any movies that you would like for me to review, um, leave a comment in, um, in the comment section. Uh, the next movie that I will be reviewing, spoiler, will be um, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. All right, have a wonderful day and I will see you in the next one.